Hello and welcome to this session on ocean-based carbon dioxide removal. Uh, my name is Oliver Morton. I'm a senior editor at The Economist, and I'm joined today by Brad Ack, who is the chief executive, well, who is the executive director and the chief innovation officer for Ocean Visions, which is a startup in this area. And to start with Brad, well, to start with Brad, hello. Hello, Oliver. Nice to see you. <laughs> and um, and. Why is ocean-based carbon dioxide removal something worth devoting um, your life to? Well, I've been an environmentalist my whole career. I started working in the rainforest, actually, in Latin America on biological diversity conservation, moved to the oceans in the middle part of my career. And throughout this entire time, while we've been racing to preserve nature and eco natural ecosystems, we've been outpaced by this larger change that's been happening across the entire planet, driven by too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and in the upper layer of the ocean. Uh, so at the end of the day, carbon dioxide removal is ocean conservation. Do you not worry that some people will look at this and say, poor oceans, haven't they suffered enough with all the overfishing and all the other pollutions? Do you really have to put them into some sort of, press them into some sort of like extra service as carbon dioxide removal? Can't we just sort of like withdraw from them and let them try and recover from the insults that we've already thrown at them? It would be lovely if we could do that. Uh, unfortunately, we have, um, we have changed the biosphere too much to now be able to walk away. Uh, the oceans have actually suffered the most, some of the most egregious damage to the biosphere yet as a result of the um, excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, and in the upper layer of the ocean. So we've driven most of the excess heat that we've trapped on the planet into the ocean. This heat is driving really dramatic change, not only in ocean temperature, but in sea level, in stratification between the upper and, uh, layer of the ocean and the mid layers of the ocean, changes in ocean currents, poleward migration of fish species, marine heat waves, bleaching of coral reefs. This body of heat is incredible and it just continues at the rate of what's been calculated to be about five atomic bombs worth of heat going into the ocean every second of every minute of every hour of every day that's how much heat we're putting into the ocean so it's pretty hard to just walk away at this point when you see the sort of crumbling of ocean ecosystems that's happening as a result of that heat and then secondly we've put about 30 percent of all of this excess carbon into the upper layer of the ocean causing ocean acidification now as greenhouse gas concentrations continue to rise these changes will only continue. So to me, it becomes pragmatic and practical to be thinking about how can we reduce overall concentrations of greenhouse gases and what role might the oceans play in that fight to reduce atmospheric concentrations? Well, the oceans at the moment, as you say, are taking up quite a lot of the carbon that we're spewing into the atmosphere. And some of it is taken up biologically and some of it is taken up chemically. Um, which of those two routes is the, other one, is, is the one that seems most promising to you for accelerating the degree to which the oceans remove carbon dioxide? Well, there's, there's two broad pathways that the oceans cycle carbon. One, one is biological, which is basically anything that involves photosynthesis. Uh, as we know, just as on land, as trees capture carbon, anything that photosynthesizes in the ocean will use carbon. And ultimately, some portion of that, uh, if it gets to the bottom of the sea, will remain in, inert. Um, and then the second is more geological processes that have uh, over long periods of time, over millennia, interact alkaline material, mostly rocks or minerals, with seawater to create a reaction that raises alkalinity uh, in the ocean and thereby allows the ocean to store more carbon in uh, safe forms, bicarbonate and carbonate forms at the bottom of the sea. There's been a lot of research recently, including a report by the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine in the United States that came out in December about these various pathways. We don't know enough yet to know which ones are going to be the most uh, 
uh, successful, the least harmful, the most positive. Uh, so we need a great deal more research and development and testing in water in multiple replicates all around the globe to be able to answer the question that you asked, which are going to be the most promising. We know that the ocean currently stores about 50 times more carbon in the bottom of the sea in a bicarbonate and carbonate form than what is in the atmosphere today. So we know the ocean has the potential with just minor uh, increases in that overall carbon storage to make a huge dent in the carbon removal mountain that we have to climb to stabilize the climate and ultimately reverse climate change. Indeed, Earth scientists point out that uh, the difference between the, the cut the climate before humans started messing with it and ice age climates is largely due to the amount of carbon that is stored in the ocean. That is correct. I mean, the ocean has played a role uh, over again over geologic time in uh, in cooling and and warming uh, um, the atmosphere. So the ocean is absolutely a critical part of the climate. And and you know the ocean crisis and the climate crisis are one and the same thing. They're simply two sides of a coin. So for those of us gathered in meetings talking about the future of the oceans, to not talk about climate impacts and what we can do about them, to me seems to be uh, missing a very large part of the needed agenda. Given um, the immense power of the, the immense capacity of the ocean as a store of carbon, do you worry at all about what's sometimes called the moral hazard problem, that if you offer people ways to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they won't uh, prioritize not putting it in in the first place? Well, I used to worry about that. And then I watched uh, for decades as we didn't uh, give people that easy out and they continued to spew carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, you know, We've been negotiating political agreements to reduce carbon dioxide for about 40 years. And every one of those years, carbon dioxide emissions have gone up. And in the last 30 years, half of all of the anthropogenic carbon has been put into the environment. So I would flip the moral hazard argument, <clears throat> excuse me, on its head at this point. The moral hazard is to continue to believe that talking about carbon removal is enabling polluters. And the moral hazard is also not taking action to reverse the enormous damage we're doing to our planet and the impoverishment of life for future generations on the planet. That's the moral hazard at this point, is to not act when we have possible ways, possibilities and ways that we might. So what are the mechanisms by which Ocean Visions itself is trying to catalyze some of this research to get these ideas better understood and more widely um, discussed? Yeah, thank you for that question. So we um, have been doing what we call road mapping around uh, key technology areas such as ocean alkalinity enhancement, uh, biological uh, macroalgae cultivation for carbon sequestration. And to build these roadmaps, we convene just, just for the for the less biological. Um, less, what what are macroalgae? Seaweeds. Cool. Any any large any large algae seaweeds, and then so um, we've we've created these roadmaps by convening experts from around the world in both these technology pathways and oceans and policy to take a look at what's the current status of these approaches, what do we know about them, and what don't we know about them, and what are the most critical priorities to advance our knowledge, to determine for policymakers, for global policymakers, whether or not these will be viable tools. Those maps are available on our website at oceanvisions.org. They're uh, They were created to be digital products that can be modified continually over time and they highlight critical research and development priorities. Now, the way we work is that we catalyze resources, we, we catalyze the funding community, the investor community, the business community to take on parts of those maps that they can contribute to. And we just announced uh, last week a $10 million request for proposals for, for critical science around ocean alkalinity enhancement. We're going to be awarding um, uh, uh, those um, those research grants later this year in collaboration with a consortium of funders led by additional ventures. That's the model for, for what we're trying to do. We're drawing attention to this 
topic. We're getting the best minds together to figure out what's the path forward to development. And then we're trying to accelerate the resources going into research and development. We are not yet advocating for deployment of any of these approaches because we don't know enough yet to deploy them. We're advocating for rapidly, rapidly scaling up the research and development, much like we saw during the COVID crisis with the enormous global cooperation on new science and new research for vaccines, for therapies, for treatments. We need that same sort of thing here in this race against dangerous climate change. What's the role for private sector investment in this? Well, there is a lot of private sector interest in carbon removal generally, and uh, I think it's really critical for a lot of that early stage funding for innovators. Um, and so we encourage the private sector to help support the research development, the creation of an enabling environment. Uh, one of the most critical parts of, enable, of an enabling environment for this um, race to remove carbon is going to be a credible governance framework globally for carbon removal, which includes credible, verifiable carbon removal standards. We've got to move beyond the sort of hodgepodge of this voluntary carbon market that we see around the world, and we need regulated markets for compliance. That will help a great deal as um, uh, entrepreneurs move forward. So the private sector can play a big role there. They can play a big role on a lot of the engineering and testing. A lot of the testing that has to happen here is at sea and the maritime industry is going to be critical for that testing. And dare I say, the oil and gas industry, um, which has more capacity offshore than any other industry, if we could change them from mining carbon to sequestering carbon, uh, that would be a beautiful transition. When you talk about the governance structure, it strikes me that something like alkalinity addition um, might in practice look like adding hundreds of millions of tons of quicklime to the sea, which people might see more as pollution. There are already constraints on what you can do in international waters under the London Convention. Is that the sort of thing people will have to look at again for these big schemes to become possible? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the London uh, Convention, um, there are some working groups that are actually proposing expansions of the language around research so that it, it's made more clear that we actually do need research in this space. And for anybody who um, has hesitancy, as I do, about putting materials into the ocean, uh, you know, think about it what the the analogy you just gave as antacid for ocean for an ocean uh that in severe distress right so we've put all this acid into the ocean because that's what co2 is it creates it makes the ocean more acidic we've got a very upset ocean antacid uh it could possibly and i only say possibly could help to reverse that acidification problem so you know, there are no uh, free lunches at this point in the evolution of our planet. We have randomly engineered the planet to within the brink of disaster by pouring every waste product that we've created into the biosphere. Now it's going to take conscious intervention, conscious engineering to get ourselves out of this perilous place that we face. Nobody wanted to get to this point in their conservation careers and their ocean uh, sciences careers, but we have to face the fact this is where we are. Well, I think you've made us very aware of the scale of the problem, the frightening um, urgency of it. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, in an effort to get, if not a free lunch out of you, at least the promise of a dinner sometime later, would it be right to think that if you make the, if, the oceans do their bit of ta in taking carbon dioxide out, then healthier oceans will be able to do even more to that end. That is exactly right, right? We are essentially trying to restore the biological and geologic functions of the ocean pre-industrial revolution so that they continue to play a critical role in moderating our climate and providing all of these goods and services like food that we've come to uh, depend on. So yes, that's why the title of this talk was, Can Carbon Dioxide Removal 
help in the race against climate change and to restore the ocean because these pathways provide that potential. Brad, thanks very much for sharing that with us. I thought that was a fascinating talk. Good luck with your ventures. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to speak with you.